Shabbat Shalom, Shema Yisrael, and welcome to our Shabbat Shalom Arab evening service of April 19th, and we will start with the lighting of our candles. Typically lit in the home by the mama, so welcome into my home, and we will have a wonderful time in unity and in fellowship of our Creator God as we remember and recall for our Shabbat. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melcha alam, asher kidichonu, b'mezdotav, b'tzivonu, l'hayot or legoim, v'natan lanu et yeshu meshechenu, or ha'alam. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and has commanded us to be a light to the nations and who gave to us Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, the light of the world. Amen. This is lesson number four in the tabernacle on April 17th, 2020 for Shema Yisrael. Let's open in a word of prayer. Adonai Yeshua, Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can take this time and set it aside to focus on you. We thank you that you are the God of our creation, that you are the God who created us, and that you have opened the way for us to have an intimate relationship with you. We thank you that we have the privilege of opening your word and studying it, and we pray now for enlightenment by the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that we might discern all that we can from these precious words as we see the beautiful picture of redemption that you have procured for us. Lord, we pray that we might be more conformed to your image as we show you our appreciation for what you have done. And we thank you that we have this opportunity now to glean from your word and to take it and share it with others. Lord, may you always be glorified. We praise you forever and ever in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Okay, we will do a quick review for those who either need a refreshment or we're not here with our first two lessons, but we won't go into all the detail that we have done already. We're looking at an overview of our tabernacle here. We remember how very important it is that there are so many scriptures, chapters given to either the construction or the, the working of the tabernacle that we know it was of utmost importance in the mind of God. We also know that it's called the tabernacle because it's uh, referring to the dwelling place that uh, was for God among mankind. It's also called the Mishkan or the tent of meeting where God met the Jewish people where his Shekhinah glory, the light you see in the back up here in, in the back of the picture is representative of the Shekhinah glory of God that's filling the presence of the Holy of Holies, but we'll get to that point in, in just a little while. We're not quite there yet. Overall, though, the tabernacle is a beautiful picture of redemption. It's a picture of our Mashiach, Messiah. It is patterned after the heavenly, and we see as we move on, as we did through our study, that the furniture that makes up the tabernacle was all placed in the form of a cross. So we're going to start through our entrance here. We'll stop right here and we'll go all the way in to get to the Holy of Holies at the end. We studied how the colors have certain meanings. We won't go into those now because as we bring them out again and again, we'll repeat their meanings at that time. We also saw that the materials that it was made out of had special meaning also. We did see that there is wood used and that the wood comes from the acacia tree. Acacia tree looks like a root out of dry ground, which is how it's described in scripture. It's known as shatim in Hebrew, and it is a picture of Messiah in his humanity being cut off from the earth. How was he cut off, humanly speaking, from the earth in the form of the cross? It was at his crucifixion. Before we go to the inside, though, we look on the outside and we see the camp, 
the the tribes the way they would break up and camp around the tabernacle we see this also was in the shape of a cross we saw that the very middle with the numbers one two three and four was where the levitical tribe camped around to keep it the tabernacle functioning while the others encamped around them we're going to go through the entrance on the east and we're going to see that it's the only way in we're referring to right here. And let me point out, sometimes in the pictures we see a little bit different renderings. It's because of artistic liberty. It's because sometimes they're looking from a different angle. Sometimes they understood something from the scripture a little differently than someone else. We don't have the privilege of knowing what the one in heaven looked like. So we can only go with what we think they did according to what we read in scripture. But you'll see a few differences at different times. One of the questions that was raised is here at this eastern gate, we see that the curtains here that are colorful are held up. Did I do that? It needs to stay where it was. There we go. Pardon me. I'm learning how to use the pointer in this setting. The curtains here are held up by four pillars. When you see later, it looks like a fourth curtain. It really shouldn't. It, I imagine that it did look like it was partitioned into three parts because it definitely was being held up by four pillars. So we'll just ignore when we see that little bit of difference. We know that scripture told us four pillars and gave us information of what they were uh, made out of. And we'll go through that again as we um, have a time when we will be repeating that uh, actually in a different area. What we're going to do though just before we go in is we are going to look at uh, the courtyard. Uh, we're looking at the gate or the door, the way in, and we see that what is around it has it blocked off. When you're inside, you can't see out. When you're outside, you can't see in. This was an immense help and concentration of the purpose of why you were there to shut out all of the outside world, to have your mind focused on the fact that you were working to have your relationship right with your God. We noticed that being eight feet high, they couldn't climb over it. They had to come through the one entrance called the way, the way uh, leading into the presence, the way leading into, well, the presence of God, the way leading into fellowship with God, the way leading into service of God. And we see that Yeshua referred to himself in Yochanan John chapter 14 and verse 6 as I am the way. He went on and he said, I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. We're going to look at the way, the truth, and the life as we go through the pattern of the tabernacle. Right here at the beginning, we are speaking about the way. Um, let me just say also between the colors and the curtains and the materials of the beams that are holding them up, we see judgment, but we also see a picture of redemption. And we even see in the white curtains that are surrounding it, the righteousness that we are made white, we are made pure through the blood of the Lamb. So we have the whole picture even in that. But now we're going to go through that eastern gate. We're going to look one more time. I believe the next slide is still, yes, an overview. We're going to come in, and here's where it looks like you have four parts. It should just still be like like a, the curtain in threes because of the four pillars. Notice there's only four gold pillars, so really this little extra is kind of a mistake, <laughs> or we don't quite understand what the artist was trying to show us. Anyway, we're going to come right through that gate, and we're going to be stopped by the first piece of furniture that you see right there. I'm showing you the close proximity. What we're going to be going to is the brazen altar. When we see the brazen altar, we're reminded that by the staves that are on the side that it was movable. This is a picture being brass of judgment. It's uh, knowing that we need judgment, bringing the sacrifice to uh, take our place, our judgment. And so we see how important it is that it can be moved because wherever we are on the life's journey, wherever the tabernacle was, they needed access to the way in to be able to uh, escape the judgment that should rightly fall on them. 
as we look at the brazen altar here, we can see that there's something beyond it that's called the laver. We'll talk about the laver today, but the people would stop right here. They would just simply bring their sacrifice as, to the altar, and they would offer it there, and then the priest would take the blood from the sacrifice. After washing the laver, then he would go on into the tent or the building that we see here in the back. Uh, but again, the sinner would only go so far, and then the priest would go the rest of the way. This is another picture of our brazen altar that shows how the sacrifice would be on top of the grating. The ashes could be caught inside the container because the ashes were to be kept and mixed with water later for cleansing. We also could see from the description given to us of the brazen altar that the height of it was exactly the same height as the mercy seat, that God's judgment is met at the exact same height with the, his mercy seat to grant us mercy rather than judgment. When we look at our next picture, we notice the four horns on the four corners. We like to say that they're pointing north, east, west, and south. And we say it that way because it spells out the word news. And it is good news that it was open for anyone coming from any direction. All could come to the altar. If they had accidentally taken life, they could run to the altar and grab hold of the horns uh, for safety. That they could not be put to death until there was time to judge whether it was an accidental or a premeditated uh, murder. So we see the, the safety, we see the good news of redemption, all of this from our brazen altar alone. Now remember, we're talking about going in the shape of the cross, the brazen altar being our point right down here at the base. Whoops. Okay, it's a little hard to get on screen. I'm not, you know what, whoops. Okay, let's go back, and I'm not going to use that. Okay. We're at the brazen altar. This is the laver that we're talking about, and then we're going to move on up. But I just wanted to point out again that at the point where we start, at the foot of the cross, that's where the blood was shed. Then the blood would be placed later at the mercy seat, and that paved the way. And remember again, he is the way. So with all that in view, now we will go to our new material for tonight. We'll start with the laver. The laver is meant for cleansing according to need. There is no description in... Are we okay? Okay, well, we're, we're here again. We're still at the laver because we need cleansing. There is no measurements given, no specific measurements like there are for the other pieces of furniture. Uh, and that is because, again, it was for daily cleansing according to whatever the need was. It was to be a representation of sanctification for us. It would speak of our sanctification. What does sanctification mean? That is our being set apart, up, away from our sin, and set apart unto our holy God. So it's really a two-part that we are removed from sin and we are set apart for service to our God. It's to make us holy, it's to purify us. Uh, the freedom from sin has been granted to us, but we need to constantly be cleansed by the water. Uh, the cleansing would come before doing the service, but it was the next step after the shedding of the blood. The blood is what gives the forgiveness of sin, but it's like 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to have that daily cleansing before we can have fellowship with our Lord. The priests had to wash before they went into the place where they had communion with Elohim. That's the picture we see. Don't go to it, but when we go on into that building, we'll see that they've stopped and they've washed before they've gone in. So we see the idea that, that this washing is uh, a continual process, and that's why there's not a size given, because it's just meant to be in perpetuity. It's meant to be continual. Now, there are other pictures of the labor. Again, we don't know exactly what it looked like. We can just do our best according to Scripture. This is another view which shows the water on top and 
uh, at the base. And we do know that the labor was for the washing of the hands that showed hands that are ready to go into service for the Lord, but it also was for the washing of the feet. By the washing of the feet, we're talking about our daily walk with the Lord, that we need our feet washed continually and our hands washed and prepared and ready to go into service. So this is another view to give you another idea whether it had water on top and the bottom. We don't know. If we go to our next, we see another view that gave the idea that they would dip a bowl and take some of the water out to wash their feet. Again, we're not told exactly how, but this one is better in what it looked like as far as materials used because it was made out of bronze or out of brass. In fact, it really was made out of the women's bronze or brass mirrors. And we remember that brass in scripture reveals defilement, but it can't cleanse. It just shows that there needs to be judgment, that it shows that, that there is sin. The water is what would do the cleansing. And it's interesting that when we read in the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, it's referring to Mashiach, the Messiah, and how he cleanses his called out assembly. He cleanses his those who make up his body. We're called the body of Messiah today. Some call it the church, the called out congregation. Whatever words you're accustomed to, this body, we're told according to Ephesians that we are uh, made clean by the washing of the water, I'm sorry, washing of water with the word, that that must be applied to us. That reminds us of Melchdavi, King David, in Tehillim in Psalm 51, verses 2 and 7, where he said, Wash me completely from my guilt. Cleanse me from my sin. In verse 7, he said, Sprinkle me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. And we know the hyssop would be dipped into the blood, but we also see the picture of the water washing. So the blood and the water together, we see, would bring that cleansing. Yeshua Isaiah 118 said, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And we're told also by the prophet Hezekiel, Ezekiel, in chapter 36 and verse 25, that God will sprinkle us with water and we will be clean. Or actually, he was referring to Israel at the time. He would wash them with water and they would be clean. With all that in mind and realizing how clean and ready the priest was now to go into service, we will now take a look at that tabernacle building. We are ready. There we go. We're going to begin to look at all of this in detail, but let's just review real quickly. We've come through the gate. The gate was on the east. It was the only way in. We went to the brazen altar, which was like the foot of the cross where the sacrifice was made for us. Then the priest went on to the bronze laver and were reminded that, that by it being bronze that there is God's judgment, but by his grace we are washed by the water of the word for cleansing. And then he will proceed into that building in the back. That is what we're going to be going and looking at. Uh, very shortly now, and uh, as we proceed into that area, or as the priest would, it would be with the blood that he was going to place on the, the Holy of Holies. It's uh, actually, he would place it there. When he went into the Holy of Holies, it was on the Day of Atonement. I don't want to confuse you, but I'm trying to say the blood would go to the mercy seat and eventually. Anyway, we are going to see that that building in the back, the one that is called the Holy Place here in this picture, and we'll talk about the covering of the badger skin later, uh, but that building is made up of two parts, and that's the top of our cross. And the only way made possible into that entry the only way to the top of the cross is through the blood. As we look at the tabernacle building now, we'll see on our next, there we go, that it is 45 feet long, it is 15 feet wide, and it is 15 feet high. It has two rooms. The larger the two is called the holy place that was 30 feet long by 15 wide by 15 high. It was twice as long as it is uh, wide. And then we have our Holy of Holies, or in this picture is called the Most Holy Place. Either one is, is accurate. 
that is 15 by 15 by 15. It is a cube. It reminds us of the New Jerusalem, which is described also like a cube that was a place or is a place of God's presence. We know that it's in, in heaven in the description that is given, and it will come down out of heaven. In Revelation 21, 16, we read how it's cubed. Uh, I think that's also in verses 22 and 23, so just read right along in there. But we also read that, that uh, it's where God's presence was, that there was no light needed because the Lamb was the light of it and because of God's Shekinah glory presence there also. In Revelation 21, 3, it talks about how He will tabernacle with us in the New Jerusalem. It really brings our whole picture together. So it's a beautiful picture of coming, uh, being right there in the very presence of our God forever and ever. Now, one thing that is hard to, uh, difficult to uh, picture from this is the fact that the, this, this uh, building is made out of wood also. We don't see the wood well in here, but we'll see in other pictures as we go on, not at, at this moment, but we will see that there were boards. There were 48 boards to make it up, 20 on each side and eight in the end. So it was surrounded by boards on all three sides, the curtain being on the front side. Now those boards, again, were made out of acacia wood. Uh, I remind you again that acacia wood speaks to the human I'm sorry, the humanity of our Messiah. We read again about him in Isaiah, Yeshua, 53 and verse 2, excuse me, that he again would be cut off from the earth. He would be cut off when he was living, and we see again it's referring to the cross. Something very interesting about the acacia tree is that it grows very well in the Arava Desert in Israel. Uh, it's one of the world's largest trees. It grows in a hot and a dry climate. In fact, the acacia tree appears to grow better during the hot, rain-free time, uh, the desert summers, than it seems to do in the slightly wetter winters. That's attributed to a large underground water source saying that the, the water is available to the long roots of the acacia tree all year long, and that they have discovered that the water flows through the trunks of the acacia tree all year long, as opposed to how it is with other trees, most of the other trees in Israel, and is why it's green most of the year also. I think, did I bring up a picture of it again? I think I did. Yes, there we go. Notice again, root out of dry ground, so specific a description of our Messiah and yet uh, so true to how the tree is many a time where you find the acacia tree growing you will see that it looks very dry around it and now with the description I just gave and with remembering what we've just talked about the water the refreshing and the renewing let me remind you that Yeshua said that out of his belly would flow rivers of living water that he is that living water that as we plug into his roots, plug is the wrong word, but as we're, we're grafted into his roots, into the root of our tree, that we are fed spiritually, we're fed the water, we're fed the water of the word, that we will flourish and we too can grow even in the dry times and be green. Green leaf and drought time, as it mentions, I believe in the, the Psalms in another place, if we have that source of water, which we know is a picture of our Messiah. It's a beautiful picture that comes out of the acacia tree even also. Back to our tabernacle though, and back to our holy place where we're building with these boards. The boards were covered with gold. Gold speaks of deity, showing once again that God, I'm sorry, that Yeshua Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. And this is a beautiful picture when we know what it's talking about of our Messiah because we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, you have been built on the foundation of the emissaries or the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with the cornerstone being Yeshua, the Messiah himself. In union with him, the whole building is held together and it is growing into a holy temple in union with the Lord. Yes, in union with him, you yourselves are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God. Or as another version says, 
into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. What are we reading and what are we hearing? What is this representing? We are seeing that it, God is likening it to that he, he is building a building. We know that He is building with living stones, that He has a house, and those who are in faith in Him are in that house, each one a precious living stone. Where do those stones come from? Well, I told you where they come from, but what are they founded on? That cornerstone, the cornerstone being our Messiah, our Savior. We know that from Yeshia, Isaiah 28, and the other places that, especially at Passover time, when we tell the story of the cornerstone, we know that the whole building rests on the cornerstone, that that is the sure foundation, and we, those living stones, are being built one on top of another, even as we see that this holy place and the most holy place was built together. And again, why? What was the reason? That dwelling place with God in the spirit. Now, the boards, uh, even though you cannot see them well, they each stood upon two sockets. I think we might find some better pictures later, but right now let your imagination fill it in for you. You're seeing boards and they're being held by two sockets. Why two? Well, two in scripture is the number of witness and the number of testimony. By two or more, it, a thing was to be established. So we are seeing here that our salvation is sure that we are secure in it because of the witness and because of the testimony, both being very important to, uh, to procuring salvation for us. And those sockets are silver sockets that they are set in. The silver reminds us of redemption. We talked about how we got that before, so I won't go into the scriptures now, but just remind you that silver in scripture speaks to us about redemption. Well, the silver separated the boards from the earth, and I think we're seeing a bit of it down here along the pillars even, but it would go behind down the sides and around to the back. Well, as the silver separated the boards from the earth, so redemption separates the believer from the world. And those sockets were about 114 pounds each. So this is heavier than we realized. It gives us an idea of the enormity of carrying this at different times also. There were five bars. I believe that we're seeing four peak out here in the side you can see one, two, three, and four. If I'm understanding correctly, and that's the area that it's talking about, why do we not see the fifth? Because the fifth one, the one in the middle, the way the scripture says it was to pass through in the center, it gives the idea that it went into a sleeve where it was not seen, but it was the support that, that tied all the others together too. So we have a picture here of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that is unseen, but yet he's the glue that's holding us together, that's binding together this body of believers that we have been referring to. Um, we read in Exodus and Shemot chapter 36, verses 31 to 33 about the, these uh, bars. Uh, so you can go read there and see uh, your understanding of it. But it's also interesting to note that even though we only see four, Five bars entirely, and five in Scripture is a number of grace. By God's grace, His Ruch HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit, indwells us, invisible, but unites us, binds us together, keeps us safe in the house of our God until we are home in the presence of our living God. Now we're going to look at that door. I think we can go to our next, what's our next slide? Oh, okay. This is showing you, we're going to see, and I can bring this out right now, I, I didn't remember to, but when we go through the furniture that's inside of this also, that's going to be our witness, that's going to be our testimony to our salvation also. And you can begin to see some of the bars on the side now, uh, you know, in different parts, but we'll look at that in more detail later again too, but this gives you the layout uh, and the curtain here in the front, even though you don't see all of it, is where we're going to be talking about going in. That's what I'm calling the door. Let's see if, what our next slide is. Okay, you can see the doorway better there, so let's hold it there for right now. And as we look at that, 
what we're going to notice is that it's 15 feet high. Remember, this whole building was 15 feet high. And we've already talked about how Yeshua said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He's telling us that he is the only way in. He even says more specifically in Yochanan chapter 10 and verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Obviously, he's speaking of the door to the whole sheepfold there, but he's still referring to himself as the door. Now, remember when we talked about the way and we looked at that first entrance on the east, we talked about that was the way into God's presence. That was a way to go into the presence of God for fellowship and it to be in, in there for service for him. We talked about how going in shut one in and shut out. Well, the way in is through the truth. And that's what we're going to see as we go through this door that we're going to call the truth. We're going to see the witness and the testimony by its very contents. And that the means of worship for today, we are told that after salvation, the means, the way to worship God is in truth. Yochanan John chapter 4 and verse 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So a beautiful picture. I am the way, I am the truth. We'll see also that we're not going to leave out I am the life. That part will come later. Now, going through this uh, door, through the curtain, but through the door, going into this part of the whole tabernacle, remember, was only for the priests. The sinner stayed at the altar. The blood went on and, and the sacrifice of the lamb in the place of the person. Lest that discourage you and you think you're left out today, remember today we have been made the priests. We're told by Kepha. Kepha was a good Jewish um, Talmud. He was uh, one of the followers of Yeshua Jesus, and he was one that Yeshua used to build the foundation of what we call the, the church or the called out assembly today. And in his book that bears his name, his first book, chapter 2 and verse 9, he spells it out so well. He's talking to the people who are believers like himself to encourage them and to strengthen them. And he says, but you are a chosen people, the king's kohanim, the king's priests, a holy nation, a people for God to possess. Why? In order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. That's another reason that we should remember always not only how thankful we are for salvation, but to praise him for it and to uh, thank him for bringing us out of the darkness and into the light. We are also very thankful that Elohim does make us a royal priesthood and calls us God's own possession. Don't you love that? Wouldn't you love to hear God say, you're mine, you belong to me, I want you. And that is what he is saying. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, we find a group of people that I believe represents us well. They sing a new song saying, worthy are you, speaking to, the, to uh, the Lamb of God, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain. And purchased for God with your blood, every I'm sorry, and, and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Verse 10 from the complete Jewish Bible says, You made them into a kingdom for God to rule, Kohanim to serve him, and they will rule over the earth. What a beautiful picture we have here of the Lamb who was slain, who through his being slain, purchased from every tribe, every nation, all people, he purchased people by his blood, paid his blood with his blood on the mercy seat with God in heaven, and he did it that we might become a kingdom of priests, represent him to the people, and take this good news out as we serve him as priests would serve. And one day, we will also roll with him over all the earth. That is the beautiful picture that we are seeing of our redemption and the story told from the, the view of all the furniture of the tabernacle. We have opportunity to proclaim the truth. Remember, I am the way, 
the truth. We have opportunity to proclaim that truth. That truth that we even see in the curtain itself. We see that the hangings are the same as they were for the gate. The colors are the same there also. Purple being the royal color reminds us of the royalty of our uh, of our God, of our um, Yeshua Jesus, who is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We'll talk about that in a moment. We see red, the shed blood that was spent by Yeshua to purchase us. The blue, which speaks of a heavenly color, also it reminds us of uh, him being in the heavens and where our eternal home will be. We see the white, again, a little bit of white in there that's speaking of the purity that we gain when we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, that we're made white as if we are completely pure. And let's see, we also see that um, uh, the pillars that are hanging, um, we're going to look at those. We see that here there were uh, five pillars. At the gate, there were four pillars, but here we can count one, two, three, four, and five. Thank you, Roger. You handle that pointer very well. Five, again, being the number of grace. By God's grace, we are able to go through this entrance, and the curtain held up the gate of the entrance so that by grace, we enter through the way into his fellowship and presence, and then we can also go all the way to the throne to the place to receive mercy and grace. Hebrews, written to our Hebrew people, speaks of this in chapter 4 and verse 16, where it is said, Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. What a beautiful promise given to us. And the very top, which is hidden by the, the curtain part that comes over, but the very top had gold hooks on the top. Gold speaking again of crowning, of deity, of ruling and reigning. And we know that Yeshua is crowned with glory and honor. We read again in Hebrews, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, For he, God, did not subject the angels... I'm sorry, for he did not subject to angels the world to come, Olam Haba, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him, now referring to the son of man, you have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Before I go on reading the rest, let me break that down for you. What is man that God is mindful of him? Why does man care? He didn't do this for the angels. He did this for man. And what about the Son of Man who he's concerned with? We, he took the Son of Man made him a little lower than the angels. That was when he took on human form that he might redeem us. But he didn't leave him there. He crowned him with glory and honor. We see the risen, the resurrected Messiah. We will see him come back in full glory. We will see him come back wearing the crown and the, on his thigh will be the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he will be appointed over all the works that God has made. We know God and Yeshua made this world together and all that is in it. But God has taken it and put it all in subjection under his feet. And as we go on, it says, For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not see all things subjected to him. Everything will bow at the name of Yeshua. Everything will be subjected to him. But at this time, we see the fight of those against him, one in particular by the name of Satan. But verse 9 says, We do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Not only coming into human, the human race made him a little lower than the angels, but his submitting himself 
unto death, even the death of the cross. As Philippians tells us that he didn't think there was anything wrong with leaving the equality of God to be made a little lower, to come to earth, to come into the form of a man that he could redeem man. And so in doing that, he suffered even the death of the cross. He was made a little lower. But again, as I have said, God raised him up in glory and honor. And that was so that by the grace of God, he tasted death rather than we. This is the picture that we are seeing that he took our place once again by it being his blood. And because his blood was perfect, because it was holy, because it was sinless, he could use his blood to atone for the sins of all the world. And that is what he chose to do, was put his blood in our place. And when we ask and receive that blood, then we come through his atoning work that we might come into that very presence of our God and see and be with our Lord and our Savior who is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is no longer the suffering lamb. He is the raised lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one sitting on the throne at the right hand of God, waiting for that day when all the enemies will be made his footstool. And when we see, or we are told when that happens, we see his return and we will see the coming of the kingdom and the setting up of us ruling and reigning with him also for a thousand years when he fulfills all the promises to the nation of Israel that have yet to be fulfilled <clears throat> Excuse me, in scripture. I think this is a good place for us to stop. We're going to look at the coverings of the tabernacle building next time. There are many layers. They're made out of many different types of skins, and we're going to find out there's meaning behind each and every one of those also. So our picture, although it's beautiful and complete today, we will see it in another level, beautiful and complete then also. It is amazing to me how many times in the, the tabernacle, and if you go to the, the overview of it, how many times the story is repeated? How many times, the, uh, well, I meant the very last one. Th that Actually, that would work. We can, we can stay there <clears throat> because we see from coming in through the way, the sacrifice blood, the cleansing and washing, and now we've just begun to enter into the tabernacle building, and we're going to see so much more as we go through the furniture that is left in there till we hit that glorious peak, the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, the Shekinah glory, the presence of our very <clears throat> God. It is uh, a blessing to just bask in that glory, to know that we don't have to wait for once a year to put the blood on the atonement seat, but that we can go through that shed blood to the mercy seat, to the throne of grace and mercy at any time that we have a need and receive anything and everything freely from God that we need. What a beautiful point to stop and to praise and to thank Him for. Let's close in prayer. Oh, Adonai Yeshua, Lord Jesus, our precious, precious sacrifice lamb, how we thank you that you have shed your blood, put it on the mercy seat once and for all, that you've opened the way into the presence of God for us, and that until we are home with you, that we can come right into that throne room through our prayers and receive all that we need. Lord, we pray for each one within hearing of this message today that if they do not know the way, the truth, and the life, if they do not know you and how to come into the very mercy seat, that they would come now through the shed blood as we have been describing, that you gave freely when you died on the cross for us and rose from the dead. And for all who do, Lord, we just pray together now, praising you and thanking you for the Tony work you have done for us, for shedding your blood, for giving us a victory over whatever we are facing today. We thank you that even something like the coronavirus cannot stop your shed blood, your protection, your grace, and your mercy. We pray for all those in need of healing that they receive the healing. We pray for each one here, no matter what their hurt, no matter what their need, that they will cry it out to you and receive freely the grace, the mercy, the wisdom, the healing, whatever it is that you freely give, Lord, we thank you because all we need is you and we have you because you have accepted us. 
You have brought us in a kingdom of priests into fellowship and service with you. And for this, we are eternally grateful. And we thank you and look forward to the time when we will rule and reign. But now, Lord, let us serve you. Let us have our hands and our feet washed that we're ready to serve in any way that you send us, anything you ask us to do. Thank you for this privilege also in your precious and holy name. Amen. Next week, the four coverings of the building of the tabernacle that you see peeled back here. We'll look forward to being back with you then. Shabbat Shalom.